is because of lack of innovation. There are things that I would have not known had I not gone to school. That I know now, that allow me to be innovative. So I think we should must look into that. There must be a consideration for taxation of corporates to fund fee-free education. The tax that we are going to collect from those who can afford, it's nothing but just a drop in the ocean. More tax need to be collected from corporates. Well, let me ask you, why hasn't that been done? Your party is in power. Why hasn't that been done? Yeah, now the problem is that uh, I'm not a treasurer here. I'm representing the youth league. And uh, we are here to make those submissions. No, uh, I understand. But why, and, uh, why I, do you think this has not been done? And uh, first, just on that one, I'm here to represent the ANC youth league, uh, the views of our 25th National Congress. Some of the submissions we have made, we have also made to the African National Congress. But there has to be a government process that runs. And that government process is what established this commission. The fact that we continue to make submissions to the ANC does not mean we must now not make these submissions here. But, but what I'm if, if, is that this requires political will, would you not agree? Yes, which this commission must then say. If we agree that we must take corporates, then this commission in their report must say, let us take corporates, because now we all agree. That would be exciting. But we've already been told by the fiscus that that's not what they want to do. Well, that's what they must do. Well, remember our. We can say to them as mm, much as we like. This is what we think you should do. The fiscus will say we know how to yeah. govern the affairs of this country. Our 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 fight for for free education does not start here, and it does not end here. Uh, it is a tire. We are in institutions right to learn campaigns of the progressive youth alliance. So it's in many facets. Here, and what we're doing here is just one of our ways, and we'll continue to do so. If it has not been done, ultimately it must be done, and we're proposing to this uh, commission that it must also consider that. If the commission agrees, and I'm happy that it's taking, uh, from what I'm reading, it, it seems to be in agreement, then we can even go and say to our own government, the commission has recommended, and we put more pressure on them. But well, let's, uh, I understand where you're going to with your, your point. Let me put it to you from a different angle. We had business come before us and testify. And we've asked them, why are you not indicating that you would that you can pay more or give more towards education because you are the recipient of these people that go to universities and TVs. And their question back to us is this. At present, your graduation rate or success rate or dropout rate is so high, your dropout rate is so high why would I want to put money into something that is broken? And therefore, should we not be fixing that broken plane? And then the, the, the analogy comes, do you fix a plane in uh, a, a broken plane in the air or make it just drop and fall? Uh, so they, from their side, they say, First, fix up your, your, your institutions in terms of the quality that they are providing. What do you say to that? Well, I, I will think firstly the argument on, on dropouts. They must, in fact, go and investigate what causes dropout rates the most. And you will find out somehow it is linked to financial exclusions. Well, uh, I'm not sure that that's correct because uh, NUSAS sorry, NISFAS, which provides huge quantities of financial support to students, has a very, very high dropout rate. So See, I think one, we, one, we one are some... Point okay. financial I think we are somehow... We might somehow not be in touch with reality. Because NSFAS, even if you qualify for it, they do not give you full 
amount of study, boarding and lodging fees. Sometimes even last year you had people who had uh, received NSFAS but not received full amounts. So uh, the argument that says because there's NSFAS, therefore there should not be uh, dropouts. Some people accumulate fees that go up to about 50,000. Every year, when you start to study, for instance, you find that the cost of study is 40,000. NSFAS can only give you 25,000. You still remain owing the institution 25,000. At the beginning of the next financial year, we go and do a right to learn campaign as the PYA. We say to the universities, those who have NSFAS, allow them in. They allow them in. Again, NSFAS pays another 25,000. 25,000 rent short. The person is now owing, by the time they are supposed to go to that year, they are owing, what, 50,000. And when they go to the doorstep of the university, the university says, no, but I can't carry you anymore. Probably that is why we have more dropouts of people with NSFAS, because in any way, people who have NSFAS are those who cannot afford. So eventually, when NSFAS short, short pays their fees, they will ultimately drop out. So the issue that I think, which I raise when we're dealing with the issue of institutional autonomy, is that when you have somehow a, a standardized education system, uh, maybe, uh, maybe for a, a, a lack of a better word, I would say I'm using the word standardized, but more like similarized, you will then have more links with government establishing from the private sector what kind of skills are required. To eliminate the dropout rate, you then introduce this issue of fee-free education. One of the reasons why our brothers and sisters, and, and, and sitting in this boardroom, I will propose to this commission that you must take at least maybe 10 days, or oh, 10 days is a lot, just three days. Go to institutions of higher learning. If you go to University of Zululand, you find that people who are studying in the University of Zululand, they are staying in shacks outside of the institution. The library closes at 10, that person cannot sit in the library and study for as long as they want because they know that they still have to walk outside of the campus. And when they are in their rooms, they can't even study properly. Yet we expect those people to come out on top. And that is why we're talking about the issue of, of, of infrastructure as well. So dropouts have a, a lot of implications to it. That is true. But you also cannot, and I don't think you are saying so also, that it is only financial. It has to do also with the quality that you have of your lecturers and the quality of the institutions themselves. And the quality of your basic education. Exactly. That is the point. So, so, yeah. So we were saying now, so when we say the corporates say you've got this high dropout rate, they're not only saying that it's financial. They're saying, fix your house in order for us to help you. In, in, in any way, uh, there are those issues, but the majority of them we believe are financial exclusions that result into higher dropout rates. The reason why we should be taxing corporates the more is that in, 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 in the country, and you will look at the last budget, you find that corporates are envisaged to contribute less into the fiscus than personal dwellers of the country. And to me, that's a problem. To me, that's a problem because corporates, their sole interest is to make profits. And when they contribute less in the fiscus, it means we are not taxing them on enough. That's one reason. The other reason might be that we are not collecting from them enough. It may also be that they're not making the profits in the present economic climate. 
No, no, no. I, 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 oh. Apologies. <laughs> I always argue. And I've argued over some time. And the ANC Youth League actually, in its 25th Congress, also looked into the issue of corporates. That we must investigate corporates more in terms of their expenditure. Currently in the mining sector, there are serious allegations of inflation of consulting fees of companies in the mining sector such that they do not make a profit. And that is why we are arguing that we must tax more in terms of corporates, but not only tax them more. Investigate if we are collecting enough in terms of what we are supposed to be collecting from those particular corporates. No, that's fair enough. That, that's exactly. something for the fiscal to do. Mm. And that, then that money should be used to fund free education. We believe that standardized education will result into a standardized institutional cost at a long run. I must explain this because it's not as if you'll wake up tomorrow because you have standardized education, then it means institutional cost will then be at a standardized cost as well. It might as well as take us time, but it is something that we need to strive to so that we do not have a situation wherein there are these gaps, others are getting more, others are getting less. It becomes somehow a, a bit more of a flat surface. We believe that fee-free education should be coupled with investment in infrastructure, in the sense of residences and other buildings, that uh, an, an infrastructure that is required. Because currently you will find a situation where a person is taken in by an institution, but they can't guarantee that person accommodation. Mm -hmm. And that's a serious problem. This person comes from KZN, goes through to go to Univenda to start because he's been accepted at Univenda. Then Univenda cannot provide accommodation for that particular person. So infrastructure, which is strategic in nature, must continue to be invested in these institutions of higher learning. So it, it is something that must go hand in hand. And more so because of the issue I said earlier on. When you open for free, free, free education, we are opening, it's like you will be opening up the floodgates of heaven. Everyone will want to start and we must be prepared for that. But I do think in your proposition, it's not everyone. It's all an academic merit. That mm. would still have to be there. You don't, you, I don't think you are proposing, unless you are, mm. I don't think you are proposing that everybody must now be allowed to enter the doors of learning irrespective of academic merit. And that academic merit must also, in any event, be debated and discussed, I've got no problem with that, but there must be some kind of, of qualification you need in order to enter the doors of learning. Yes, that is true. Uh, currently, a person now pass, when I, when I was still in uh, high school, you used to have to pass with an exemption to be admitted. Now you must pass with a bachelor in order for you to be admitted. And obviously, you, you can't take that away because also there are other institutions like FETs which must also produce a, a different set of individuals who are needed by our economy. But at that access level, we are saying you must do away with this thing of University of uh, UCT, University of Cape Town, adding their own uh, qualifications in, t in top of qualifications that are already there. A person can come with a bachelor and say, look, I've passed with a bachelor, uh, with an access to go and do a bachelor, they apply it to University of Cape Town. University of Cape Town says, no, through point scoring now, which is an additional, which takes us back somehow to the issue of autonomy, because they can decide on their own. They still decide that you can come in, you can come in, which means they control the floodgates to education. Well, but it, you, you, I'm sure you have to concede that even if you have free, free education for everybody, there still has to be control as to the numbers that go into the institutions. 
It's, uh, so, yes. so, for example, if the University of Cape Town can only take 10,000 scholars, students, then there's no point in admitting 12,000 because mm. they don't have the facilities for 12,000. So there has to be some means of vetting the 10,000, and somebody has to decide who's going to vet the, who's, who's going to admit the 10,000. You can't have a man sitting in a government office in Pretoria deciding who's going to go to, un to the University of Cape Town to study. Uh, because I, I, I was going t t through to, to conclusion in terms of what are the views of the ANC, you click. I think in answering that particular question, one will be going to that conclusion. As the NC Euclid, we submit that we can attain a fee-free education system that, that is characterized by those who are able and those who afford to pay, pay, and that the determination of those who can pay and those who cannot pay must not only be about the issue of how much they make, but becomes an issue of broader, uh, of broader considerations, which, amongst others, the issue of dependence. We are submitting that we need to take away the issue of institutional autonomy, because it creates barriers and institutions to behave in various different ways. What we are saying is that you can't obviously have everyone, everyone, even those who have not passed there or matriculated at a level they are supposed to going to do all forms of qualification. But obviously, you will have that system which is in place continuing to work, where if a person matriculates with a bachelor, they can go through. The last part is that we have to invest in infrastructure to deal with the issue of the university being able to admit 12,000 students and having 20,000 students having passed with the bachelor should be solved by us investing in infrastructure. Well, let us assume the university has space at the moment for 10,000 and it's building for 12,000. And it gets 20,000 applications. Who's going to determine? which 12,000 of the 20,000 are to be admitted, and how are they going to determine it? Currently, that is the problem. I think we are, we are representing the problem. Institutions cannot take more. They can't. And the solution is not ultimately about saying, you come in, you don't come in, or upgrading the, 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 the qualification criteria. The solution that we should be preoccupied with in our minds and in our thought process is how do we build strategic infrastructure so that we can absorb more students. We shouldn't be thinking in saying infrastructure is limited, how do you get rid of those ones? To me, that is a takarish way, that will be a takarish way of, of doing it. Let us solve the ultimate problem. The ultimate problem is infrastructure. Let us put in infrastructure so that we can be able to absorb more. But there are two realities about that. The one is that it will take time to provide that infrastructure. And the other is it will take a great deal of money. And the more infrastructure you have, the more money it's going to take. And that is why we, we're saying when you open for fee free education, it's not as if you will have, a, it, it's going to be a gradual process. Numbers are going to be increasing gradually. As and when we say we are starting this year, we are taking the first people who qualify. We have taken them into the system, we have absorbed them already. But the following year, because you will be having a fee free education system, you must expect that you are taking more. Therefore, in that current year, you increase your infrastructure. It's a gradual process. That is why we're saying, for instance, as the youth league, that in 2017, you could have taken 70% of the students who are deemed poor and put them through a free, free education system with the current infrastructure.
But in the course of this year, you then upgrade that infrastructure. And we're not uh, talking about uh, building new buildings altogether. You can go to Johannesburg's. They are building that are sitting still that are owned by public works. That if they were to be renovated, they will provide accommodation for students who are studying at the University of Johannesburg and, on, and, and, on, and all these areas. It's a gradual process. So it's a gradual process that must start. The problem and why uh, the youth are becoming impatient is that we are not moving. We are not taking the first step. Instead of us taking the first step, we think in the sense of what are the barriers. So I'm saying, let us remove the barriers. Let us start to think above the ceiling now. Well, now That's just, the argument that we are putting forward. I just ask you something. If you have 100 students yes. and you could afford to pay, to allow 50 to go feed free to the university and the other 50 not to go, is it better to have the 50 to go fee free and exclude the, the second 50? Or is it better to have a loan system for all 100? No one in the face of the earth will argue it is better not to admit the 50. The problem is that our thinking process, Sorry, I, I don't I, I'm, I'm saying no one in the face, in the face of the earth yes. will say don't take in the 50 because you will leave out the 50. Obviously you must take in the 50 out of the 100. Why must you not take in the 100? Because you do not have the infrastructure. No, no, I think perhaps the chairperson is, is putting this. I think the nuance is gone, going beyond the infrastructure now. Okay. He's saying, if you have a hundred students and you've got the money to take the 50. Fee free. Fee free. Yes. Do you take the 50? Or do you take the hundred and say the hundred, all hundred, is actually on a loan scheme? Do you see it's on moved an, away from, on an equal loan scheme. from the oh, okay. no, I, 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 I get it. So it's about a budget issue and the availability of resources and them being limited. Obviously, you will have to then prioritize. Those who can't afford more must be the ones that go through first. So, the issue is that you will obviously not wake up to, from, from, from my thing. You, won't, you can't wake up, and that is what we believe in. You, you can't wake up and then have everyone who has not been in the system, and you want to put them in. Otherwise, you'll have about 6 million young people that you'll have to put in. But it is about sorting out these issues. For instance... But you can level the playing field by giving everybody the same opportunity. And then saying all of them must Every, pay. Everybody pays. White, black, rich, poor, doesn't matter. Everybody pays. Then you are not leveling the playing field if you do that because right. those who can't afford will not be able to go through. Those who can afford will go through. No, well they you can't. then they don't have sort to of commodify. They uh, don't have to pay until they can afford to pay. And then you say they must then pay that man, which is a current system of NSFAS, which we have said it's not assisting itself because it does not cover. Well, nobody pays. It does not cover. It is, it is rather now a, a, a stance issue where I think maybe we'll probably have to no, well, agree to the, disagree the, the, the that our, 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 our position is that if you take them in, those who can pay, must pay. But at a process, at a start where you have to prioritize, then you must prioritize those who can't afford more and those who can afford, they must pay yes. progressively. Well, I'm putting this, this suggestion to you mm -hmm. that the important thing that is, is that the greatest possible number should have access to education without having to pay at the point of education. If you understand what I'm saying to you. No, I, I don't understand. Well, this is, let me try it this way. At the moment, you've got barriers for some because they cannot afford it. Yes. So the chairperson's 
proposition to you is you take that barrier away completely. You then say everybody will have access to university. There won't be any barrier of finances because it will be paid for you. At the point when you can afford, which is later on, then and de depending on your affordability, there will be percentages aligned to your income and so forth. So at that point, everybody would then pay back. And everybody is treated equally. So, so it is, that's the proposition he's putting to you <laughs> and yes. wanting your comment on mm. it. Well, and, 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 and I'm putting it uh, to the Commission that uh, we do not believe in that proposition. We believe that we must have a system of fee free education for those who cannot afford and for those who can afford they must pay. If at any given moment or time the conditions of those who are admitted on the basis that they can't afford and later they are determined to can afford, remember we've got that proposal that we made of SARS and at a point then they are determined that look this one now can afford then it is flat annually that that person can afford. And you don't have to go and disturb the child at school and say submit uh, that you can now afford and all those things. You immediately tax that particular person and it contributes to the fiscals. That's the proposition that you are coming here as you click. Unfortunately, the next two slides I've just uh, talked to through this question and answer session because if you look at them, it goes through the issue of where we believe we can collect some of the revenue vis-a-vis -vis our budget. As you can see, uh, corporate income tax uh, being almost half the size of corporate income tax being the half of the size of personal income tax. So you can't say the burden for free education must fee free education must be borne by uh, citizens but it must be borne by corporates. We've got views on those issues. For instance, you've got corporates who are just uh, mining and taking away raw materials freely and willy-nilly out of the country. They are not taxed. And they go and make money for their own countries. Whereas, for instance, if a person mines uh, uh, gold, they go and take it somewhere. That gold is not processed to be final products. They then open manufacturing plants in those countries where they've taken the gold and what happens at the end of the day? Our own citizens do not benefit. Whereas if you start taxing them now on those particular raw materials they want to take out of the country, you limit them. They actually start opening plants here and our citizens can afford even more to pay for their own education. So those are some of the propositions that we have made which I think are there on the presentation. Uh, and uh, Chair of the Commission, uh, Honorable Judge, we would like to argue as the ANC you click that fee free higher education is possible. We must be committed uh, towards finding uh, solutions the most rather than identifying problems. Because part of the issue is that we tend to identify problems more and be less solution driven. We must consider that education is a necessity, which is something that we all do not argue. But lastly, as the ANC you click, is that we will make a submission that the nation must work together to find solutions, uh, not consistent critiques that are not solution driven. And uh, that will be the end of our presentation. Well, one important element about any funding system is that one should try to make it sustainable. Now, constant taxation is not generally sustainable um, because taxation depends on economic climate, it depends upon uh, the number of corporates that are doing well and so on and so forth, uh, it depends on personal incomes, um, being able to bear the burden of taxation, um, but it may not be sustainable and it would have to be increased every year in order to meet the inflation levels and so on and so forth. Um, how do you propose that, that uh, education should be made sustainable? Yeah, the cost of education yeah. should be made sustainable. The proposition that we are making is that this is a cycle. And it goes to the issue of saying 
when you are putting free education, we are not just throwing money, but in the long run, you are actually increasing the fiscus in terms of people who are going to work in the future. And as a result, in about you, we anticipate you put in five billion in the first. In, let me say you put in and make an example. You put in one hundred billion over a period of three years in order to produce, say, about uh, two million graduates. And those two million graduates become innovative and they join the working force. Immediately, because they are now educated, they bring a cash injection into the fiscus. In as much as you are taxing, but you are surely going to be collecting more at a later stage because you are having less people who are dependent. And when you put free education, which is a very important and fundamental call we've been making as the ANC Youth League, we are spending a lot of money on grants, welfare grants. But if you put people through an education system and the country grows economically, those people you in the future you will have less people dependent on a grant and being able to go out and find work because now they are educated so it's not a vicious cycle that because you have you are taxing today therefore you will consistently uh, uh, tax and not get any returns government will obviously get uh, uh, returns and that is our philosophy when we approach the issue of of of, of free free education now, it's clear from what you said a little bit earlier that you have a view on the Nkastana report. Uh, <laughs> would, you, would you like to explain to us what the view of the ANC Youth League is on the task team report that Mr. Nkastana has chaired? Well, our overall view uh, is that we, we, we have some problems with it, but I will not be comfortable in dwelling into that report very much here. I think that we must be future-looking uh, let's not dwell much in, 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 in the past. Let's focus on what we can change. And what we can change is to make recommendations that says, yes, let us go for it. Let us implement free, free education for the development and the future of this country. It is the only thing that can build. Well, you, you, know, know, that, you know that the Kusana report has recommended that there should be fee-free education at a low level and that it gradually tails off as the income level increases. Yes, I'm fully aware of that. Yes. The problem is that such recommendations till to date they have not been implemented. And that is why I'm saying I would rather reserve that we, we, we sort of dwell much into the past but focus on where we are going now. Well, Otherwise, we will we'll consistently discuss reports. No, no, no. Yeah. no. But the, and Kusana report is going into a pilot stage mm. with the proposal that if the pilot stage is successful, it be implemented next year. That is what we have consistently argued as well as the NC UTLIC. If you look at, uh, we have said even this year that it was possible for, for government to take in all the first year students through a fee free education structure. So you are, in principle, in favour of the of the trend of the Kusan. There report. are some there are some aspects that uh, we are not happy with. One of them is what I had actually cited around the issue of the 122,000. So that is why I'm saying I would rather avoid or I'm, I'm uncomfortable with discussing that particular report uh, here, because there are aspects that we are happy with it. There are aspects that we are not happy with it. Thank you. Rather, we make our proposition and we say, let us look into the future. Thank you. There's an issue that I must put to you and, and ask for your comment or the ANC Youth League's comment. Now, you know you're aware of Section 291B of the Constitution uh, making reference to further education. There is also a covenant dealing with social and economic rights which we have ratified as a country that speaks to education and then goes further in that it says you must realize free education. 
Now, in your deliberations as an organization, or let me com complete the, the narrative. The, the issue then was that the government made certain reservations on that covenant, and one had to do with education. However, what they did was only to make reference to primary education and say that it will be done in light of our national education policies and uh, education policy. Now, secondary education and higher education is left out of that reservation. So, I'm asking, in your deliberations as an organization, because I would be putting to uh, the ANC later today, the mother body, the same issue. In your deliberations, have you considered that, taking into account that in South Africa, education is compulsory from the ages of 7 to 15. So that was the primary education in my mind that is being referred to. Yet there was now some kind of caveat to primary education and not to secondary and higher education. So taking all that, I hope you've uh, taken into account all that I've said. If not, you can ask for clarification. What is your organization's view with regards to that? I, I, I'm tempted to uh, to behave as if I'm not in the boardroom because I think we must be very radical in that particular approach. Look, our view as the ANC you click is that whatever it takes, if the constitution must be changed, must strive for the change of the constitution. If legislation must be changed, legislation must be changed. The ultimate objective and what concerns us the most is not prescripts that throw loopholes, but to close those loopholes and deliver filthy education for the young people of this country. And whatever that must be done, must be done, because the future of the country depends on it. And it's something that when we argue, it might seem as if we have a bit of arrogance to it, but it's the passion attached to it. We must do whatever is highly possible. You see, perhaps, and I'll try to put it to you better. Mm. On the face of it, what I put to you was that the government must provide fee-free education, not to the poor, to everybody. And that is not what you were saying. Mm. On the face of it, what I have put to you says you must provide fee-free education to everybody at higher education and our, secondary our, our, education. Our, yes, and our view is that those who can afford must pay for their education. Thank you. Um, there's just one last question from me. Uh, we've, we've received a, a number of calculations in terms of what the cost of fee-free education is going to be. I've seen that, uh, I think, uh, three slides back from, from this, this one here, you've indicated that the, based on the assumption of that 70% of students do not afford, afford currently a total of 38.2 billion is required to fund free education. I just wanted to find out where the origin of this number, what, what the, where this number comes from. Okay. We had commissioned uh, some research on this particular issue. And some of these figures, I believe, they've been presented here before by the person we've been working with in the development of that particular research. If not, I've got the thick document which provides uh, the baseline for all these figures. They have gone to the Department of Higher Education and Training for verification of those particular figures that are contained there. Uh, and I believe the Commission is in position of these figures. Um, if not, then I, I, I would gladly provide the basis of where we make those particular assumptions.
I, I just wanted to establish your understanding of this number. Is this just the, 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 fee, comp the fee component of, of the cost, or does this include the subsidy that goes into funding universities? The direct no, no, this is on top of the subsidy. There is a subsidy that we talked about. We said there is a subsidy that university currently, is, currently are getting, and that subsidy makes the cost of education go down. As a result, the fees that you see when the institution says for a BCom degree, this is how much it's going to cost you. It's actually they're offering that after they have considered that there is a subsidy that has gone to it. So we have been using the figures that are being provided whilst the subsidy have been provided to universities. If I, may, if I can try and make it more clear, eh? you have uh, the University of uh, UNISA, University of South Africa. If I can just pull through here, in terms of... You have UNISA. They will charge a degree uh, citing an example, I'm not sure of the actual figure because I don't have it here. They will charge about 30,000. But that 30,000, they are charging you 30,000 because they have also received a grant and a subsidy. Had they not received a grant and a subsidy, they will probably be charging you 40,000. Ne? Therefore, when we are calculating how much it will actually cost, we are ca calculating it on the 30,000 which is exclusive of the grants, which means in total overall, we have put forward a figure that is exclusive of the grants and subsidies that government is currently providing to these institutions. Thank you. Right, thank you. Uh, there are no, no further questions from us, Chair. Thank you. Mr. Nzuza, thank you very much indeed. Thank you for subjecting yourself to our questions. We appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate uh, the opportunity uh, to be here on behalf of the ANC Youth League, which is very passionate about the issue of uh, free education. We do not believe that just by doing -doy on the streets we can achieve, but we also have to match the Berkeley of us being on the street, match it with the Berkeley of being able to be here and provide some form of solutions and intellectual thinking to the process. Yes, we accept that that is so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. May we um, adjourn for lunch now? And then Quarter half. Yes, 20 minutes.